Uh, today we're going to talk about end-to-end -end security for uh, Java E mobile applications. Not talking about Java ME, we're talking about web applications, things like that. Mobile web, but also hybrid clients and, uh, and, and native, uh, native clients. Uh, so let's get started. First I'll introduce. Okay. So my name is Marius Bogovic. I'm working for Red Hat in the JBoss division. I'm working on uh, two projects, Snowdrop and JBoss Developer Framework. The latter is actually the one that's, that's more concerned with the security yeah. aspects of the discussion. So my name is Jay Balunas. I'm a JBoss core developer. I used to be the Rich Faces project lead, uh, and then over the last year or so, I started being the Aerogear project lead, which is a uh, one of a newer uh, mobile mobile focused project at JBoss, which I'll introduce a little bit later as well. I'm also uh, Red Hat's representative on the W3C and on uh, the JCP for for a couple of JSRs. So let's start right off the bat with, you know, why is security important, right? It's kind of a silly question, especially for enterprise developers. For the most part, we know why security is important, right? And that's pretty much because of threats, right? We have to be careful. Uh, you know, threat is a malicious action that will compromise your data or, data or identity. And uh, Marius, I love this image that you found, by the way. So. You have threats because you might have vulnerabilities, right? Opportunities to materialize threats, right? Loopholes or problems with your procedure, um, perhaps a, a weak link, so to speak, all right? But there's lots of different types of vulnerabilities. There's, uh, you know, there's infrastructure vulnerabilities, there's application development issues and, and, and problems there. So what we're gonna be covering today is how to develop secure applications with Java EE and, and some of the some JBoss projects. We're going to talk about the enterprise Java server side. We're going to talk about uh, mobile and desktop web applications. Right? There's not a lot that applies to mobile web that doesn't also apply to, uh, to a desktop application. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, hybrid applications and, uh, and native applications, although some more details on uh, and, and examples around native uh, Native security access will come a little later. So first, I just want to ask a question: How many people are familiar with different with uh, hybrid mobile applications like Apache Cordova, Accelerator, PhoneGap? All right, so not too many. So I'll give a brief overview. Uh, there's really a, a spectrum when people talk about web, right? And so, or I'm sorry, when they talk about mobile. And so you have one spectrum where you talk about mobile web. It's where you go to Amazon.com and it shows you a pretty picture that fits your phone, has different button sizes, handles touch events, things like that. On the other spectrum, you have native applications. You build them with the native SDKs, Objective-C, Android, Java, .NET, things like that. It gives you full access to all the SDKs. It's good for games. It's good for you know, high performance applications, things like that. Uh, and then somewhere in the middle, you have hybrid applications. And as I mentioned, there's a few projects around that. There's Apache Cordova, uh, Accelerator, Trigger IO, uh, Sencha Touch, uh, different things like that. And effectively, what they all do to different levels is let you use uh, web technologies, or in some cases Ruby or, or other languages, to define an application once, and then compile it or or wrap it into a native application that you can then put in the app stores. They, they often give you bridges into native functionality. For example, Apache Cordova. You simply get a JavaScript library that you can access the camera, the events, uh, calendars, things like that. And so I just wanted to kind of break down the, the different types. So what we're not gonna cover today are infrastructure issues, right? That's probably Oracle Open World. They're, they'll have a talk on that, I'm sure, or they probably already did. And we're not gonna talk about DNS attacks, uh, wire sniffing, Right, cross-site scripting, or I'm sorry, cross-site request forgery, those types of things. They tend to be more infrastructure issues as opposed to application development issues. Although, depending on how you develop your client application can have a role in that as well. So why mobile, right? Uh, it's probably a silly question uh, to, a, to a lot of people here, and that's probably because um, you've got a lot more of them, right? How many people here have a smartphone in their pocket? or are holding it up to take pictures. Um, and how about tablets, right? I'm surprised everybody didn't raise their hand again. Uh, so yeah, so there's just, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more of them. And what does that actually mean? It means that there's multiple ac access points per user. 
So all of a sudden, you instead of one access point at your desktop when you log in at 9 a.m., you've got an application that you can access three or four different ways, you know, wherever you happen to be. And so the other issue around that is that you can end up, depending on how careful you are, with data replicated everywhere, right? So you can end up in a situation where you've got data in multiple points, you have to be careful about making sure that data is synchronized and, uh, and kind of managing that. You also have more operating systems, right? Uh, you know, late 90s, pretty much mobile, pretty much the web one, right? I mean, there's the, we certainly still have native applications, you know, client server applications like JavaFX and others. But for the most part, you know, a lot of Java EE became focused around web-based applications because it gave you a single operating system effectively, right? The browser, although there's different, you know, tweaks, you're still building a website. It was a very well-known paradigm, you know, HTTP, HTTP session, right? The security models there. Some of those don't apply anymore, or they, they apply differently, and you just have to be aware of how those may be different. And so, you know, now you're, when you're dealing with .NET, you're dealing with Objective-C, even Android Java. It's Java, but there's definitely some differences. You just need to be aware. So mobile really complicated, you know, security. Yeah, it complicated security in some ways, but there's not a lot about mobile that wouldn't apply to desktop applications or laptops or, you know, if you have, if you're building a native application in, in Windows 8. It's, apparently, I, haven't, I don't have proof yet, it's not that different from building one uh, for, the, for Windows Phone 8, so. But it's still important to know especially for, for, for our crowd, that servers are the gatekeepers, right? That is where you know, we as Java enterprise developers have control in a, in a layer in the application stack where we can provide um, the application security. We, we choose what we expose in endpoints. We, we get to manage that. Uh, and so you know, to some degree, that's part of what we'll be talking about next. And it's actually Amaris's turn now. Don't trip on my my tether. My tether. You're wired. You should go wireless. Mobile is called after. So we, Mujia and I actually started looking at this presentation and started thinking about the problem. And we try to define what exactly is like what are the challenges across the entire spectrum, the entire uh, an entire mobile solution, right? And we try to take a look at all the all the areas. Like where is where are, the, where are more challenges? Are there more challenges of the client? Are more challenges on the server? Are more there are more challenges on the uh, in in the communication between the two, right? And actually found out that each side is actually has a lot of responsibilities and has some problem to solve, right? Now let's let, let's take them one by one. I'm going to start with um, in between because this is more infrastructural than application based. So for the most part of this, uh, uh, your, your infrastructure solves these issues. It has less to do about how you develop your application, but more how you configure the communication. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to speak. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, where these concerns actually overlap with development methodology is where clients, is how clients access servers through different protocols. So this is where you start looking at some specifications around web and JSON cryptology. So you start looking at HTTPS. You start looking at, at uh, secure web sockets. You're starting looking at JSON web encryption. You start looking at web cryptography API, right? But again, these are not things that you necessarily, that are part of your programming model, which is what we want to focus on next. On the client side, a lot of the, is actually, the, the client side, especially for mobile, is the one that contributes to the complexity of the problem. Why? Because in, with, a, with a mobile device, you carry data with you. Your data, uh, it's, it's, you need to do that because you have to take into account that your client may go offline, your device. So basically, there is a trade-off between how much data you want to keep on the device and 
how much data you actually want to keep on the server and just retrieve when you need it. And it's serious because your device can be lost, stolen, and so on. And you don't want anyone to get access to it. In the same way, authentication and authorization becomes a problem. Because every keeping, for example, a client permanently authenticated, keeping a mobile device permanently authenticated, again, is a risk in case when they are lost or stolen, as I said, right? So here you have to be pretty smart and you have to be to do some trade-offs. And they are basically, you have to trade off between the convenience of, of uh, between, for example, storing principles on the client side or using a token-based solution. This is all stuff that you have to weigh in and your, your solution has to take that into account. At the same time, again, keeping data on the device implies a trade-off between security and performance. Do I have to fetch data every time? Depends on the amounts. Depends on what kind of data. I may not want to keep all my social security information, everything that defines my digital identity at the fingertips of someone who actually can get access to it other than me. On the other hand, there, there is, for example, information that can cache and it's not necessarily super secure that I can store. So when you define the solution, you have to take that into account as you have to take into account windows of trust, which means that you may keep sensitive information, you may keep your client logged in for a while, but then after some time, you may want to incorporate things like, um, for example, like losing, like ending a window of trust, and basically cl the client becomes untrusted and has to authenticate again. Or you may want to have a phone home functionality to make sure that the client actually has like it's still in the, it's still who it, who it claims it is. Basically, it belongs to the person. It belongs to you. The server side is, let's say, if, if the client is the most vulnerable, the server is the one that actually does most of the work. It's responsible for authenticating the clients. It's typically, especially if, we, if we're looking at a Java E solution, a lot of the application logic is on the server and access to it has to be secured. So basically you're thinking of, uh, you're having to do authentication, authorization. You have to authorize access to RESTful and web service endpoints. You have to consider even non-HTTP clients, what you do with WebSockets and so on. Other aspects on the server side are identity management. So basically, you really not only want to have access to information about your users, but you want to manipulate that in a way. Even when it comes to, uh, to authentication, you have multiple ways in which you can do it. So you can have an in-house database, you can have a, an LDAP server, you have an active directory against, your, uh, against which you authenticate, or you can have something, you can have more of an open world type of, uh, of application. You may want you to authenticate against a social source like Twitter, or Google, how many of you like to subscribe to a site every time? How, how many of you prefer, for example, just using their Google account to authenticate on a site? Okay, a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's really an, um, an application, like it's, it's really, it's really, there is a variety of possible solutions depending on the use cases, and you have to take that into account even on the server side. There are performance implications to all this. As I said, security is most of the time of, uh, a function of security and convenience. Mobile, mobile applications are somehow different than, let's say, the classic security model where you open a browser, read your email for five minutes, close the browser and go off, right? Data remains on the client. So you have to think about it, whether a session-based model, for example, is suitable or not. Session-based is, is very convenient because every request basically, it, it, it establishes a window of trust, which is, per, is completely managed by the application server. At the same time, it's not very scalable. Every session, consumes a bit of memory. So while well, you don't need to check authentication every time because you're, it's kind of caching your session, 
it's really not very convenient for your application size. So you may want to consider a different type of solution, token-based. Now, token-based means that a token travels back, and this is all what the client sends. And here you have to send to think about how long do you want to keep the token? How long is the token valid? You have to consider the fact that every token basically needs to be re-authenticated in some way. So you need to establish who was the actual, uh, who is the owner of the token and re-establish the, the, uh, the uh, identity of the requester and so on. Again, it is a trade-off. You have to take into account whether you have a solution, for example, you have to account, take into account when you consider session and token, you have to take into account whether you have a single server or you have a cluster or you have a cloud. Migration of session data between, between them or using a sticky session, uh, 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 sorry, sticky request model, a sticky session model is actually, again, something that um, can decrease the scalability of your application. So basically, let, let me just go through our, our solution and try to, to kind of show you how we, thought, how we thought about solving these problems. First, we are adamant about using Java EE. Um, it's, a very, like, it's a very powerful platform and we want to use it to, the, to its maximum extent, to, to the maximum extent that it can, it can provide us with uh, it can help us, but how many of you are using, for example, JAS? Fewer people than the ones that want to log in on Google and, or Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically JAS is while well, JAS is the native security model of, of Java EE, it's not a very suitable one. We don't find it to be very suitable for applications for an application development model. It's very coarse grained. It's basically providing, in, it's provides integration with servlets with EJBs, but we're looking for much, much more. We're, we're looking at, for example, a, a more complex programming model that allows us to find, like to provide some fine grain, a fine grain authorization model, and something that's not necessarily based on users and groups. We want to have IDM, identity management, be able to manipulate that information. So basically, we are looking at something else. And that something else is what we actually want to show you today. It's a solution that combines, on the server side, uh, Project Picket Link that provides a security framework for Java EE, and AeroGear, which extends and builds on top of, 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 the, of the Picket Link facilities both of them providing a together a comprehensive front to back or end to end security solution on the server and client. And this is something that you don't like well well while a lot of these these challenges are like are due to like are the fact that we are talking about mobile applications. Actually it's not like this solution is not limited to mobile. A rich desktop application has to some extent, the same challenges. And this solution actually helps solving them. The same thing, it works in the same way. It works for both private servers. So it works for both in-house servers, but it also works on the cloud. And to that extent, the core of this solution is Java EE. It's still Java EE, it's not JAS. We are using the Java EE programming model, CDI to actually power this. How many of you, of you are using CDI right now? How many of you are considering using? How many of you are considering going to Java E6? Adopting. A few. So CDI is basically the programming model of Java E6. It provides dependency injection. It provides cross-cutting cross -cutting concern management and so on. And we're actually building on top of it using the PicketLink project. PicketLink provides a comprehensive security framework. It provides identity management for users and roles. So it's basically holding all the information, all the mappings between 
what user what users do you have in the system, what groups they belong to, what roles do they have, and so on and so forth. And not only it's capable of interpreting that, but also manipulating for different sources, like a database over JPA or Active Directory over LDAP, or even external sources of information, like using things like OAuth, OpenID, SAML, and so on. On the other hand, it provides an authentication and authorization model, which is extensible. So it has different forms of, of, of authentication, form or digest or certificates. It also has different ways of expressing authorization constraints, like SAML, XACML, or business rules. So it's very extensible in that, in that respect. What we are what we try very hard as part of the solution is hide some of the complexity or some of the sophistication of picket link and keep the power under a veneer of a very simple and intuitive programming model, which again is CDI based. So essentially you have access you can you have access to your security context through dependency injection. You can use an intercept, you can ha use an interceptor based model for authorization. And in fact, we use interceptor bindings from CDI to actually create an expressive security language. We use CDI events for application stuff, for, for security status changes. What does it mean? It means that when someone logs in or logs out or there is a security um, um, unauthorized access attempt, the application will send an event throughout. You can observe that and react to that in your application. The whole picture of what I said is this. CDI is binding, is providing the, uh, the link between the power of picket link and your application model, which can include, so it can use basically this model to secure not only, let's say, EJBs, but also other components like RESTful endpoints, simple POJOs, business services. You can use it for securing your web layer. So let me just walk you to, to understand when I say it's a simple model. Let me just show you how very quickly how it's done, right? How do you configure security? It's very simple. You have a fluid API which actually allows you to produce security configurations. Now, this is basically, this method is a producer method that creates an object right, that PicketLink will use further to create the security infrastructure. And what do we do here? It's basically we define this authentication strategy, which is IDM based, as opposed to other things, like OAuth or something else. We establish an identity manage. We define the identity management strategy. So, which is the store where the uh, that that the uh, uh, that the security information is coming from? And we we define where the security sessions are stored. So, just as a as a note, just as a note, um, Pickling provide a, provides a way that once you authenticate it, it retains the information about the fact that you're authenticating and gives you a token. You can use that token to actually prevent logging in every time you have to make a request. And this information is actually stored in the, in the session storage. Now, this is not your HTTP session. It's separate, which allows to actually use an in-memory mechanism or use a data grid to store this information and so on. On the other hand, the identity store itself for example, the, table, the, the set of tables where you store your user group and role information, right, is again configurable through another B. So you have another CDI producer method which actually sets it up, right? And basically, with these two beans injected into, into this, uh, injected into the picket link framework, once created from at the application start, that's all I need to do to actually set it up. What it will provide me in terms of an API is another, it is a, <clears throat> are a few other beans 
that I can use in my application to actually perform various operations. So this makes it very easy, for example, to log in. The only thing I need to do is to inject my login credentials in a class, inject my an identity object, and then very simply I pass on a um, credential information and I, I tell the identity object, the, the object that manages the identity state, that I want to log in and that's it. After past this point, if the credentials are right, I logged in. And actually, because the model is extensible, credentials can be a lot of other things. Certificates, for example. UUIDs. UUIDs, exactly. So it's, it's extensible at that level. Logout is even simpler. So I just have to tell the identity, the, um, the identity status mean that the currently logged in, that the current user that's using the, that, uh, who's, um, that the application is, is that, that's working with the application needs to log out. Creating a new user, so covering the other part, not only consuming the security information, but actually manipulating it is also easy. So I can use the identity manager beam, inject the, in the, that can, we can inject an identity manager too, and basically I can use it for creating user, updating its passwords, or granting or removing roles. Right. So that is covering the other part of, of, of uh, the identity problem. Well, they can come from everywhere. As I say, you have an identity store. It, it, you can store them in LDAP, or you can store them in JPA, or in, in a, sorry, in a database. That assumes, yes. Yes, that assumes, it assumes that you have, like you have a source of information and it's configurable. So you can configure the tables that you use. If you have, for example, pre-existing data, you can grab that. The fact that you have, that you use dependency injection actually allows you to configure the application. Like this. Pick, it link, pick it link out of the box comes with, um, comes with a set of default roles and groups and then it's certainly extensible after that so part of what we want to do is make sure that there's a there's a there's a rapid uh, development process to get started right to give you things like a, a, a JPA based uh, identity store right you might not want to do that because you're talking about unencrypted database right but it gives you the the application developer the ability to get started start working on your application and then pick it link behind the scenes of the application developer can swap in an LDAP, right, without you having to go change every one of your beans, for example, right? That would be one of the one of the nice things about that. Uh, so that that's just what Picket Link comes with out of the box. Gives you a, a better uh, a better starting better starting uh, I don't know, feel. Right, and basically, like what we show here is probably one of the simplest use cases. I'm more trying to emphasize the point that it's easy, like it that it's that what you need to do to actually get things started is to create a bunch of, of beans that represent, your com like, that represent your configuration and represent how your security is actually stored. And you use that model to, to, to kickstart the, the security engine, right? There's a question over here. Yes. Over here. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Speak up a little. Like, sure. Yeah. So the, the first line you've got. Yeah. Is that going to pick up a login process or is there going to be login process? <laughs> okay. Let me ask. Let me take this for the benefit. So the question, the question asked was whether the first line kicks in a login process. No, it does not. This is just manipulating the the the, the way in which the users are stored. You can have a login afterwards. It depends. Like you can part of the same request have a login, but it doesn't happen automatically. Your code may do that. It's, it's more flexible than automatically doing a login. It's like a, think of a registration form, for example, exactly. and we were actually going to, add, to show you how we have an, uh, uh, a registration form that does just that. We have a demo, so maybe some of the things will become clearer in, in that context. <clears throat> the last part that I just wanted to show is 
how do I secure the code? So securing the code is very easy. It's basically just a matter of applying some security bindings on methods. So you have here, for example, an, a RESTful endpoint. But you can secure anything. It can be a regular CDI bean. And we, what we say here is that only users with the role ad, admin can do anything, can access any method of this class. But we actually, if you look at the list all methods, we are customizing it so that even users that have the role simple can do that as well. Now, when you look at roles allowed, you may think of the roles allowed from EJB, but it's not. It's, an annot it's a special annotation that is that you that, that the picket link project has created. So it's defined as using the security binding type meta annotation on it. Thank you. <laughs> Which basically allows you to set up an annotation and then define a handler that processes it. And this way you can actually go and create different types of restrictions within your application. Not necessarily only the ones that picket link has provided but also other ones. And basically, that kind of shows you what we do on the server side. Now, Jay is going to show you how AeroGear provides a combined server-client solution for this. Excellent. Yes? Yes. Yes, I mean the handler the handler is basically where your your security logic would would go essentially. And the point I was trying to make here was that this allows you to kind of customize what kind of security you want. It's not only roles that you want to have. You may want to have something like time-based security. Eh? Someone can access this method only on Mondays. It's it's a different type of of, of uh, it's a different type of, of restriction, right? So it's not only what comes out of the box. You can define your own. Yep. No. No, it's using, like, it's using an ex a CDI extension project called Delta Spike, if you've heard of it. But it's not JAWS. It's not JAWS. It's not using JAWS underneath in any way. It's really completely something completely separate all right all right so um, so now you guys have you, you guys have actually got me a little curious because you I know it's like the last day but almost there was very few people that said that they're using Java EE right now so what what are people using right is spring MVC how many people are using spring MVC right now all right so quite a few are you using the spring security modules that are in there all right and then I'm assuming some of the some of you other guys are on Java uh, EE five five five, and then plans to go to six. There was a couple hands that were raised, so I was just kind of curious what people were running. All right, so the AeroGear project is um, is a new project I mentioned earlier, uh, and it's focused around around um, native client library development. So what we're talking about there is JavaScript, iOS, and Android libraries for developing uh, different types of mobile applications, providing a consistent approach to server connectivity. So what that means is, is the server is going to have a defined API, whether that's REST-based or WebSocket-based. And um, one of the things that's a little different about, about AeroGear uh, that, that some other projects have had problems with in the past is we want to create, for example, our Objective-C library. We're not creating, we're not gonna go and try to talk to Objective-C developers and tell them you now need to program like a Java EE person. Because nothing will get an iOS developer to run faster than showing them Java and Java EE. And so what we want to do is actually, uh, we've got some guys on the team that, that are familiar with iOS development uh, and, and our experience there. So we're developing APIs for, for the, the target platforms. Um, our initial priority is security and persistence. Right, so basic basic persistence, and then the so the security we're talking about today, and then more uh, more to come. 
but that's just kind of that's just the start of what we're talking about with Aero Gear. Uh, we're also going to be doing native push and non-native push. So that's going. When I say non-native, I mean uh, like web sockets or long polling, Comet, that type of thing. But also uh, native push. So actually working with Apple and uh, and Android uh, servers for for push notifications when your apps are offline. And so if you can if you start if you mix if you mix push with messaging you could see JMS messages going to and from na native clients, for example, right? If you create that pipe, you can have, you could have a CDI event that's triggered on the server, you know, update and, and trigger back to the client device, right? And then we're also talking about data synchronization um, and then offline support with things like the phone home and things like that. But these, these are gonna come a little later. Um, we're, we're currently focused on uh, security and persistence as I mentioned, we're a relatively new project at uh, at JBoss, and so um, you know it's we're as I mentioned, we're actively in development. So that we have in, we have all of these libraries today uh, at different stages of development. We've got Arrowgear.js, which we use for mobile web, which is what we'll show you today, and then also uh, Cordova support. So you can you can run these inside of a Cordova application. Uh, to give you give you one way to access secure backends and and persistent. We also have an iOS library that's actually in Cocoa Pods. It's kind of like a Maven repository for iOS, um, and uh, you can you've got some people you can download that and and try that with your iOS application. And then the the, Aero, the Android project is actually you know surprisingly since we're all Java developers is. Is actually, uh, you know, in early development as opposed to having having something complete, uh, complete and ready at this point. But uh, but it's getting there. So this talk is security focused. So where what do we, what do we mean with security with Aero Gear? Um, you know, we, we want to simplify the auth star across multiple clients and across these modern clients, right? So we're going to have we're going to have different ways, or we're going to have platform specific ways to access the security that Java E provides, right? We got, we, there's a huge base of Java E users already. And you know, a lot of you are gonna have mobile requirements. How many of you have mobile requirements today, actually? Like your boss said, make me a mobile app. How many of, that, how many of those are mobile web? Web-based. How about native? Native? All right, and then how about hybrid? Hybrid-based. All right, well, so that's a really good mix, actually. That was that was a little less for hybrid, but the other two were pretty even, so that's good to know. Um, so as as Marius talked about earlier, we've got Picket Link on the server side. That lets the the you know the details of the implementation get swapped out underneath, and and frankly, at in, at my project level, I don't care. Um, and then Arrowgear itself exposes different um, different endpoints that and and basically. APIs to the client libraries uh, to to handle that inter, that interaction the, the integration. So as I mentioned, um, Aero, the ArrowGear.js is is one of the farther farther libraries or uh, more complete libraries at this point, and uh, it has a concept called pipelines. So this is how you hook up to different endpoints and different servers. So you create a pipeline to a to a set of RESTful endpoints. You can define pipes. To the to those RESTful endpoints, and then once you define that within your JavaScript code, uh, it's very simple to then save, uh, update, delete, modify, query uh, based on those endpoints or based on those pipelines. In a similar way, we have authenticators, and we'll walk through the code in just a minute on how you set these things up. And uh, one of the neat things about this is every pipe that you define can actually have its own its own authenticator. Now, what that means is that when your boss tells you you not only have to interact with the service you you control, but you also have to inter interact with a service you don't control, then you can change out the security mechanism uh, for that pipe. So it could be a different implementation. Um, now, right now, this is REST-based by default. Uh, we do have plans for WebSockets, uh, OData support, which is a, a kind of an extension on top of REST, um, but as I mentioned, we're 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 at rest right. We're using rest right now. All right. So the server side off. That's our. That's right now. That's our endpoint. The name itself may change. 
So this is this is our our client security interface uh, at the moment. I mean, there's some obviously some sub some restful endpoints underneath that. It's uh, JAXRS based. But right now, it allows for login, logout, and register, and um, it also has some token-based security that we've kind of pulled through from PicketLink. Right, so here's just an example of that. Uh, how many people here are familiar with JAXRS actually? Wow, good, lots. Um, so here's an example of, of the authentication endpoint that we have. You see we've, we're injecting a few, a few of the PicketLink items, right? And then that's just an example of the, the method. We can, we can look at the code more later. Uh, so what's important though about that is how we set up the client connection to that endpoint, right? So this is JavaScript obviously, and here's where we're, we're asking the Arrow Gear JavaScript library to create me an authenticator. In this case, we call it REST auth. We can give it a name. We can choose whether or not it's session or token based here. And the AG auth name is gonna change because that doesn't make much sense to me. And um, you know, that does what, that, that flips the bit on, on what Marius was talking about. Whether or not you have a session based authentication or, or a simple token based. And then obviously you need, a, you need to tell it where the, the, the auth endpoint lives if it's not, if it's not the root. I keep thinking I'm gonna trip on my tether here. Not used to that one. All right, so now you get that set up and you have uh, an authenticate, authenticator on the client. What do you do at this point? Well, login is pretty straightforward. Um, again, that's one of the goals of all of this is trying to make application development as easy as possible. You know, while PicketLink does a lot of complex things under the covers, so does so does Arrowgear client libraries to make it so that you, you know, for the most part, you give it some, in this case, pass, uh, username and password as a JSON token, and then just call login, and you'll get a callback if the login succeeds and an error if it doesn't. And then you can query what that error is and different things like that. In a similar, in a similar fashion, you can just say, you know, rest off logout. And obviously for the other, the other client libraries, there's a, some similar approaches. So on the server, these are just the, the abstracts of the, uh, the endpoints, right? You've got slash login, slash logout, uh, you know, it takes JSON both ways. So it can actually pass back some, uh, some status information. Yep. Yep. If they're this, if it's the same authentic authenticator used. So I'll show you in just a minute. So now, I'm, the, the the very next slide is actually how to how to how to hook up the authenticator to the pipeline. So you beat me by one slide. Um, so you know, as you started, you know, great. Now what? Right? You, you're connected to an authenticator on a server. You can log in and you can log out. But what do you have to do next? Right? You have to configure a secure act endpoint for access. Um, and so this is a this is how you create an Arrow Gear pipeline object. Uh, and it's kind of similar to the to the authenticator. You're creating, you give it a name, tasks. Uh, you tell it what URL represents the the root of the uh, of the uh, endpoint, and then in this case, we're setting the authenticator to rest off. And so in the in the demo code we have, there's actually three of these. There's it's a simple to do app. There's tasks, projects, and and tags. And each one looks just like this, you know, obviously with the names are, names are slightly different, but they all use the rest off. And so what that means is the, creden the, the credential or the, the, secure, the secure token is shared across those. So then back on the server, Mary already showed this, I'm not gonna get too far into it. Um, you've got the slash tasks, endpoints, and the slash projects uh, in different roles allowed for those. All right, so now, how do you actually use the pipeline? So here, imagine the user just clicked a, you know, a new task button. You're gonna say task.save, pass it in data. Data could just come from a form. You can construct it yourself on the client side, what have you. Uh, you pass it in. If it's success, you do whatever you need to and you're in your standard callback. If there's, a, if there's an error, you can actually switch off of, the, off of the response code of the RESTful endpoint, which is kind of nice. So you can switch off of a 404 as opposed to a 401, 
right? But a 401 is, is, is unauthorized. So here you could hand, you know, you're not, you need to log back in, you, you know, refresh or, you know, clear the application cache and show the login screen again, that type of thing. And this is all that you, this is all you have to do in the code that needs to kind of be repeated around, right? You have some setup and then the code that you have to write more, more often is as slim down as we can. All right, so before we get to the demo, you know, there's still a few things that are up to you, the, de the application developer, to make decisions on. And it's important to know that that's, these, you want to be able to make these decisions because different applications have different requirements, right? If you're talking about DOD, you might not even store usernames. It might just be, you know, a random, randomly generated hash ID that represents a user that the server then needs to, to modify. Or it might be, in, you might store nothing on the client ever. Or it might be something like Netflix, where with Netflix, if you use their, their services, um, you can download and store uh, their, or if you use their application, I should say, you download and store all of the, the client catalog or the movie catalog, but not the account information. Right? That's a decision that they've, they've made as a company, not to, not to store account information in a cache on the, on the clients, but you can store the movie listing, right? And then get deltas because they don't care if you have that. Um, you also need to think about how chatty the authentication should be. Uh, what I mean by this is um, as the UI is generating, the, as the client is generating the user interface, admins might get extra buttons, right? And so, you can ask the server, you know, can, is the user auth authenticated for this button? Is the user authenticated for this? Uh, it's typically a bad practice to, you know, retor return things like pure roles, right, to, a, to the client, right? You don't necessarily want your client to know this is admin. If you might want it to know that the user has access to X, Y, and Z services, then the client can go and make those decisions on what the UI should look like. Uh, you need to model, model your endpoints and your access. Uh, there's a project called JBoss Forge, which can help with that, by the way, but I won't get too far into that. And then you have to think about encrypted client storage. A lot of devices, a lot of the, the especially the newer devices, have really good uh, hardware-enabled encryption, which means that you know, sometimes that lets the application developer off the hook because you can, you can enforce rules as a company to say you must use hardware encryption uh, if you lose your phone. But at the same time, you know, projects like Aerogear and others are, are, do work with things like uh, JSON encryption and web crypto and other projects like that. And then our roadmap quick, uh, you know, Aerogear is new. You know, we've, we've been at it for a little while now, but we're still under development. And uh, we're planning to have a, a final release around the end of the year. And uh, it's also a great time to get involved because we're talking about some of the latest technologies in, uh, you know, in the industry. And for the most part, we're still, de we're still determining different parts of our, of, of our end project, right? And so if you want to get involved with an open source project, it's, it's a great one to, uh, to do that with. You can check out our new aerogear.org site. And anyone who's interested, I've got some Aerogear stickers up here. Look great on your laptop. Uh, so anyway. All right, let's get to the demo quick. Um, you guys can actually all access. Go, oh, go ahead. Right. So this, so the what I'm talking about. A, it's a future. We don't do it today. We don't. But what we're talking about is interacting with uh, the web crypto standard, and there's a JSON, JSON encryption standard. So that's that's more around uh, encrypting the the back and forth. Not not local storage, right? Right, just the, the the communication channel, right? That way you can do do some of that communication, not in SSL or HTTPS, right? But you still need might want to secure it. What? Yes. Sure. So, you mean trying to damage the app or trying to like get access to the server, that type of thing? Well, like, uh, 
So with right, right. I mean, what you're talking about is multi-tenant client support, right? Where you're talking about what you with, and a lot of the controls around that are actually based on the mobile the mobile operating system you already have and what you expose. Uh, Apple, for example, is very restrictive, right? There's not a whole lot of inter-app communications that are possible. But with, or you have, to, there's some, a lot of hoops you have to run through. Android is a little bit more, is a little bit more open. And I think it, I think it, it goes to the application, application developer to be, to be aware. There isn't like a specific tool, at least that I know of, off the top of my head that manages that. You can restrict, like when you when you develop an application, for example, you can restrict the, especially when you have something like Cordova, for example, mm -hmm. for instance, <clears throat> you can restrict actually the servers that they can connect to. So basically, you cannot issue requests, and you cannot receive malicious code, for example, from from your application from a, from an already logged in application. So you have you have basically a uh, you have a level of like as Jay says there is some stuff that the iOS that the operating system doesn't allow you to do and then even there 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 are ways of actually configuring your application from being forbidden to do certain things <clears throat> at the application like from within the application configuration itself. Yeah. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that you guys did a great right. job preventing unauthorized access to the server side. But I think there's another piece is that on the client side, you also want to have some kind of framework right. helping the developer get the things done. Right. So, because what you're talking about is really inter-app, yeah, yeah. right? You're worried about a, a malicious app going, trying to get to another one, right? Uh, I'll tell you one of the biggest things that drives me nuts, nuts about Android and even iOS, uh, iOS, but especially Android, is that when you typically create like generic projects in like the SDK, like all of the functionalities are turned on. Right, that's like it's, so. It's, some of this is just configuration knowledge, right? Knowing that knowing that you have to change the configuration so that it's not open to external uh, external inputs, right? Things like that. All right, so we're actually pretty close to out of whoa. We're actually pretty close to out of time, but I do want to show you the demo. You guys can actually go to it yourself if you want. Um, that's just a picture of uh, that's our new Arrow Gear site. It uses uh, responsive design to uh, change automatically back and forth, but based on the the device type. But let me see. So all of you can actually. This is a cloud-based application. It's actually up on uh, JBoss's Open OpenShift, our PaaS offering. If you go to uh, to do auth dash arrowgear.rhcloud.com. You'll, you'll see this application. Uh, this is the, a web version. We have an iOS version under, under development right now. You know, it's pretty typical. You can create tasks, you can take, create projects, things like that. Um, and what I wanted to show is the network here. Actually, I'll run it on my local. So I'm just gonna log in here. I'm gonna do uh, John. And the username and passwords are John123 and Jane123. You can also register new users as well. So now I'm logged in and you'll see what happened is, let's see, where'd it go? Right here. This is the login request. So this is the request to the auth login endpoint. And that, that's what was handled by the source code. One second. I'm not, my screens aren't mirrored, so it's kind of difficult to see back and forth. So this is the, this is the primary JavaScript file for, for the demo. And so this is just the expanded version of what, what I kind of already showed in the slides, right? So you set up your arrow gear off, 
and then here's here's some different pipelines. Then down below is the is the is the login. Um, where is it? In the case of the login, doing rest off that login that type of thing, and then handling the error, doing different things based on that. So let's see. I know we're almost out of time. So here, if I'm logged in as John, I can do anything I want. If I'm logged in as Jane, if I try to add a project, it's going to tell me the you know authentication error. You're not allowed to do that, or authorization error. And also, if I try to go, if I'm not logged in in a tab, and I try to like go to the get request for projects, it'll actually return the four the four hundred one, the unauthorized, from that. So uh, if you're interested in checking this out more, this is up on GitHub at, uh, at github slash dot com slash arrow gear. And it's just the, the to do application. You'll see some blogs and other things as well. And, you know, as I mentioned, uh, if you're interested in participating in the project, you know, let me know or just, you know, show up at our, our website or our IRC channel. I think that's probably all the time we take some questions or if you want it, you can come up front and, and we'll talk to you. We've got stickers. All right, thanks a lot, guys.